In this presentation, I'm going to be talking about tax evasion and FATCA. I presented this at the 4th International Cyber and Economic Crimes Conference, which was in KL in Malaysia on the 22nd of October 2013. In the agenda, I'm going to be talking first about tax evasion. I'll take you through the hidden economy and I'm going to show you some statistics from the EU, which will highlight why tax evasion is such an important problem. Then I'll talk about the top 10 countries for tax evasion. <clears throat> I'll take you through an Asia PAC review of uh, the vulnerabilities that exist in Asia PAC. I'll talk about the reviews needed within banks. I'll talk about a list of red flags, 30 red flags from my article on tax evasion. I'll then talk about tax avoidance and how it links up with tax evasion uh, and, and the recent focus of OECD on this area. Then I'm going to go into the second section, which is on FATCA. I'll give you an overview of FATCA, and I'll talk about some focus areas for banks. This is the Times Magazine cover, 1983. As you can see, tax evasion was a significant problem 30 years ago. It's a significant problem today. And uh, the earliest known incidence of tax evasion goes back to 5,000 years ago. So, uh, you know, this is a problem that... Uh, is an ongoing problem and it would require an ongoing focus by regulators to uh, fix it. Uh, and it may never actually get fully fixed. So the European Commission defines tax evasion as comprising illegal arrangements where liability to tax is hidden or ignored by hiding income or information. So this refers to all kinds of sophisticated structures where, uh, for example, companies book their profits overseas in low tax jurisdictions. So those are the sorts of things which we'll talk about. Tax fraud is defined as including situations in which deliberately false statements are submitted or fake documents are produced. The term tax fraud in the EC definition is a bit more direct where uh, in, in tax returns, the uh, you know information provided is uh, clearly fraudulent. So for example, a company has a couple of bank accounts uh, that it does collections through uh, and some of the bank accounts are for cash sales and it doesn't declare those uh, cash sales accounts on its books. So, you know, things like that, which, uh, which, are, which are a more direct definition of fraud. Uh, tax evasion is a bit more subtle, and, uh, you know, there's this fine line between tax avoidance, which is legal, and tax evasion, which is illegal. I'll now talk about the hidden economy uh, in, in the EU. So, as you can see, Euro 1000 billion a year worth of public money is lost due to tax fraud and tax avoidance in the EU. This works out to about 2000 euro for each European citizen every year. And this is 514 billion is the EU's 27 deficit in 2012. So as you can say this, as you can see, this deficit is dwarfed by the uh, overall size of uh, tax evasion and uh, the size of the EU, the EU as opposed to the EU 27 the size of the EU budget for uh, commitment appropriations, which is basically budgetary commitments which could be spent in that year or future years, is 147 billion. So this figure of 1,000 billion euros is more than the EU 27 spend on healthcare and more than four times what they spent on education. So that's why this is a very important problem. And in terms of the shadow economy, overall, 20% uh, of the EU's GDP, approximately 20%, is, is the, is the uh, is estimated value of the shadow economy. Two-thirds of this is from undeclared work, and a third of this is from under-reporting of profits of business. So the 10 countries with the largest tax evasion in this slide uh, is, as you can see, the US is the largest with $337 billion. Brazil, 280, Italy, 238, Russia, 221, Germany, 215, France, 171, Japan, 171, China, 134, UK, 109, Spain, 107. So, uh, you know, these are the countries with extremely large tax evasion. Uh, the countries which stand out in terms of the size of the shadow economy are Brazil, Italy, Russia, and Spain. A uh, good question would be, why is India not in this list? Uh, I assume it's because uh, this is focused on economies of a certain size. 
and uh, India is of course a huge economy. Uh, India is a two trillion dollar economy. China, in comparison, is a nine trillion dollar economy. Between twenty third twenty twenty and twenty thirty, India is expected to grow rapidly, and uh, by twenty thirty is expected to actually be a larger economy than China. Let's now look at an Asia Pack review. Tax evasion is now a predicate offence for money laundering in the new revised FATF forty. Of April two thousand and twelve, as a result of it becoming a predicate offence, there is going to be a greater sharing of information using AML channels, which basically means that the financial intelligence units and supervisors will be able to exchange information on tax evasion in through the AML channels. In the past, they could not do this. This basically means that banks that uh, have tax evasion monies will become much more vulnerable to a charge of facilitating money laundering. So tax evasion is rampant in Asia. Offshore vehicles such as complex uh, trusts in you know layered trust structures, etc., are are used to uh, facilitate tax evasion. The Financial Action Task Force is very focused on improving the availability of beneficial ownership information in trusts. Uh, trust registries is one option offered to countries, but in any case, the focus is on trustees to improve beneficial ownership information. Company registries also tend to be weak, where they may not fully maintain the beneficial ownership information. For example, nominee shareholders and nominee directors could be used for, uh, you know, evading the knowledge of the beneficial beneficial owner. The Financial Action Task Force is again focused on this, and they're saying that beneficial ownership information needs to be recorded both within companies and in company registries. As far as nominee shareholders and directors are concerned. They're saying that these nominees must disclose to the company and to the company registry, or these nominees need to be licensed, and they also need to disclose to the company registry, and they need to maintain their own own information. In my experience, I've seen that uh, individuals are often paid small sums sums of money, such as five thousand sing or five thousand U.S. dollars per month to to become nominees and. Uh, you know they're they're relatively untrained for this role and they do not realize what being an executive director really means. And I, I, my personal impression is that registration of nominees is completely essential. Then issues around source and use of funds. So you've got non-bank cross-border movements where you've got, for example, credits from money services businesses, which uh, you know could be from a country which has poor AML regulations and standards. Uh, And and an example would be a credit into a Hong Kong account from an MSB in Bangladesh for a Malaysian client. Then you've got trade laundering, which is underpricing and overpricing, and trade laundering schemes to help to transfer value across border, and this includes tax evasion monies. And so, if once you've taken your tax evasion monies out, you could recycle them abroad and bring them back in the form of loans or payments to consultants, or even just set up, uh, you know. A rep office for the firm overseas, and you become the representative. So uh, then, of course, you have the presence of unrelated third parties and receipts and payments, including, uh, you know, nominee shareholders, directors, etc. And then you've got undeclared accounts. You have some accounts for unaccounted sales, uh, for example, for cash sales. Uh, so these are the ways and mechanisms of, uh, you know, laundering money, of 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 uh, tax evasion and laundering money. And of course, individuals and sole proprietorships and unlisted companies tend to under-report receipts and over-report expenses. And your MNCs and medium-sized enterprises would indulge in slightly more subtle legal tax avoidance, which borders on evasion. So we're going to discuss this a little bit ahead. Monies tend to be linked to tax havens with high banking and corporate secrecy. High banking secrecy basically means that if you go to the bank, they won't tell you who the beneficial owner is. High corporate secrecy means you go to the Company registry, and even if the beneficial ownership information is is has been taken by the registry, it's not of a public record. So, uh, what are these tax havens? You can look at the Tax Justice Network's Financial Secrecy Index. Uh, that would be useful. The OECD also used to have a list of uncooperative cooperative tax havens, but this is now currently nil, indicating that all countries are ready to cooperate. Uh, but I would suggest you look at the Tax Justice Network's uh, you know list. Bankers need to understand country risks, the risks of evasion, and the risk of uh, concomitant regulatory pressure, 
and they should be reflected in their cross border policies which come out with the from the legal department and uh, bankers need to rethink their business models so those banks which have accepted tax evasion monies in the past cannot do so in the future and they have to be careful and uh, you know they have to uh, do whatever the regulator is stating to identify these accounts and uh, you know file sards close them down where needed so what are the reviews needed bankers need to identify all high risk accounts for tax evasion they need to flag them they need to file suspicious activity reports they need to close down accounts where appropriate and they need to enhance their overall transactions monitoring programs and that's of course the photograph there is of the italian prime minister berlusconi and he was convicted for tax fraud so in terms of the reviews of existing clients and new clients bankers should look at negative factors and positive factors positive factors for example does the client have a big 10 tax advisor do they make tax payments from bank accounts or any other confirmation on tax compliance available the mas highlights that it's a good idea to take confirmations from the client that the accounts are fully tax compliant and they also highlight that this confirmation from the client does not exonerate the bank from the responsibility of effective transactions monitoring to make sure that this account is not used for tax evasion so a static list of negative factors is 11 red flags in a static review and that list of red flags I'll discuss in the next slide uh banks may not have immediately all the information for these 11 red flags but uh, that's where data quality comes in and and uh, some amount of data quality work would need to get done uh, you know probably prior to a, a a proper review and where you have um done this review of static negative factors and uh, you must perform enhanced due diligence where needed including negative news beneficial ownership verification transactions review and confirmation that these transactions are in line with the source of wealth and there's a list of dynamic negative factors which is an additional list of 19 red flags which should be used in any detailed review of transactions so what are these two lists this will be discussed in the next slide so uh, the static list includes 11 points uh, my tax evasion article which is available on my website has all these points i'm not going to discuss all of them i'll just discuss the ones highlighted so links to unrelated third parties for example power of attorneys or signatory through loans uh, given or loans received through collaterals nominee arrangements etc unduly complex ownership structures for example three layers in which the beneficial owner is not clear and abusive trucks trust trust arrangements in tax evasion schemes where effective control remains with the taxpayer and frequently there tends to be more than one trust which are vertically layered in a more dynamic list of uh, red flags things like the business account not being used for utility payments of course there could be companies which have multiple business accounts and their utility payments and salary payments only go from one of them so uh, but nonetheless uh, this is in general a red flag and then you can investigate it uh, further wire transfers sending and receiving monies overseas for offshore loans wire transfers payment of overseas consulting fees especially if loaned back credits to accounts of non-resident foreign nationals for money service businesses in markets with poor aml controls especially from unrelated third parties for example credits going into a hong kong account from a, you know from a money services business in bangladesh for a malaysian client then trade based laundering schemes that overprice imports used in manufacturing shrinking profits and evading taxes or underpricing of goods and services in exports now let's look at tax avoidance so bankers receive tax statements in lending and investment banking transactions uh clients may make fake statements to the bank which should be picked up by the anti fraud controls i'm using this in the sense of you know the guy the guy does not have a tax statement or he's materially altered the tax statement that he has submitted uh and on the other hand you could have fraud in the form of misleading statements made to the tax authorities uh so you know the numbers which were presented to the tax authorities are fraudulent the tax statement by itself is is not fraudulent because that's what was actually submitted and of course in this scenario the banker's role and capabilities are suspect uh 
in the more subtle form of tax avoidance which is legal tax avoidance you know there's a fine line between legal tax avoidance and illegal tax evasion and uh, you know some of the oecd reports in 2013 talk about multinational subsidiaries and they say that mnc subsidiaries may exist in low tax jurisdictions with little evidence of value creation in order to shift profits for example shifting debt to high tax jurisdictions by borrowing more in these jurisdictions transfer pricing charging lower prices for sales to but paying higher prices for purchases from low tax jurisdictions transfer pricing licensing patents to affiliates in low tax countries thereby shifting income if the royalty or other payment is lower than true value of the license other ways specific to the tax laws of the two jurisdictions so in in summary in all these uh, you know little games that are being played out here what the company is trying to do is that in a high tax jurisdiction you're trying to reduce your revenue and increase your expenditure and in a low tax jurisdiction you're trying to increase your revenue and reduce your expenditure that in summary is what all this this entire game is about in terms of the medium sized enterprises there's slightly different uh, not identical but slightly different typologies where aggressive tax planning amongst group companies including transfer of intangibles example patents and other mobile assets and overcapitalization of low tax companies if you want to understand what is overcapitalization of low tax companies please google it and then you have the aggressive tax planning on after tax hedging to make higher returns without actually bearing the associated risks uh, to give you an example you decide to buy us dollar shares so you are working in a country which Uh, you know so you're staying in a country which is not us dollars so you know it's, you could be staying in in any in any financial center and you decide to make investments in us dollar shares your company decides to make investments in us dollar shares it borrows in so as a, in order to make that investment it, it it hedges the foreign exchange risk by borrowing in us dollars and and making that investment and then subsequently when it sells off the shares it it repays that loan so uh, you know if the foreign currency has weakened then uh, the 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 company would actually lose on sale of shares and gain on borrowing for the purposes of of uh, looking at their tax uh, liabilities uh, in a neutral tax liability scenario the losses and gains should be netted off but however in many jurisdictions the the losses and gains may be treated differently so for example uh, your gains may not be factored into income for the purposes of tax and your losses may be you may allow the losses to be netted off so depending on whether the tax code has been uh, written properly or not there could be lots of scenarios which allow the company to make higher returns uh, without actually bearing the associated risk so the regulatory perspective is for example the mas points out financial institutions are not expected to determine if their clients are fully compliant with all their relevant tax obligations globally nonetheless saf filing is required wherever the bank is sure or is uncertain that the foreign tax violation is of a type which singapore imposes in july 2013 the g20 backed the plan to curb currently legal tax avoidance by large mnc's new tax laws are expected and role of banks could evolve significantly however even current investment banking business that facilitates legal tax avoidance can be challenged and high transparency to tax authorities is needed and of course there is this case of a bank which made a one a uk bank which made 1 billion pounds a year in annual profits from helping companies indulge in tax avoidance and uh, between 2000 and 2011 they made a total of uh, gvp 9.5 billion and they had there were two basic loopholes which they exploited the first was commercial profits from buyback of bank's debt where they were where they were not taxed and and of course this loophole is now being closed and uh, the companies have been taxed retrospectively uh the banks have been ta- taxed ret- retrospectively and the second scheme was to create investment funds that gave tax credits where no actual tax had been paid and this loophole has also been blocked and of course in this entire review the uk government has severely criticized the accountants uh, for their role in Uh, tax evasion they felt that the accountant should be pointing out these kind of uh, gaps to uh, the tax authorities rather than facilitating uh, the companies to exploit these uh, gaps and and um, indulge in in uh, tax avoidance
Let's now look at FATCA. The reason why the US has this uh, huge focus on um, tax evasion is because of the significant amount of uh, money which is being evaded in taxes. And uh, as you can see, $376 billion is, uh, or 84% of the overall tax gap is because of underreporting. And of this underreporting figure, the majority contributors are the individual income tax and business income at 48% and uh, individual income tax other income which is another uh, 15%. Offshore bank accounts tend to be key in uh, the exploitation of the tax system in, in the US and, uh, and of course US actions against Swiss banks include a US dollar 780 million fine. So that's, that's, that's one good reason to look carefully at FATCA to see what uh, you know, accounts are being booked at uh, your bank. So just in terms of an overview, so you have the, the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act in 2009, which came into force in, uh, in March 2010. It supplements existing qualified intermediary regimes, and it's all about information based on US indices here. So if you look at slide eight, uh, the first six are really the FATCA uh, indices here. And so based on this US indices here, you're supposed to scan your database and identify potential US persons. Uh, so it impacts foreign funds, alternative funds, private banks, etc. Currently, US source withholdable payments uh, are, are taxable and US source withholdable payments means fixed or determinable annual or periodical, which is FDAP, gains, profits, and income. This includes things like rent, dividend, interest, pensions, royalties, commissions, etc. And uh, a withholding tax of 30% is to be taken for a recalitrant account holder, which is basically a suspect US person who is not cooperating, or a non-participating foreign financial institution, which is an NPFFI, or as per the intergovernmental agreement, which has been signed between the US and your country. So the way it's been implemented is that intergovernmental agreements, which is the IGAs, is the, is the US IRS, IRS's new approach. And information is exchanged via tax authorities. I mean, there are other options, but this is the, this is the preferred information exchange uh, mechanism. And uh, instead of withholding, reporting is needed to the IRS and upstream financial institutions is acceptable and this is in the UK IGA. So the UK IGA clearly states uh, and, and this is more from uh, you know the, the, there is a separate uh, HM customs advisory which, which talks about this point that instead of withholding you will basically report it to the IRS and upstream financial institutions uh, in the US and the upstream financial institutions will do the deductions. However, financial institutions need to register with the IRS uh, by 25th of April 2014 and withholding will begin for the US source FDAP payments after 30th of June 2014. The UK IGA also takes into account the fact that, uh, you know, also uh, basically says that you do not have to at this point close down recalitrant account holders accounts. So this is a huge change from the way FATCA was originally envisaged. And two important points have been deferred. So the definition of foreign pa pass-through payments has been postponed till 201 -17. It was impacting even those financial institutions with no US clients. And foreign pass-through payments basically includes withholdable payments and other payments which are attributable to withholdable payments. And, and this is of course a very, very ambiguous and highly questionable definition which uh, is, is still being worked out. And the uh, US IRS is also going to work out an alternative approach to the gross proceeds withholding concept uh, where you can incur taxes even with losses. So if you make an investment, if a foreign financial institution purchases stock of US dollar 100, it goes down to US dollar 50, uh, at which price it's sold off, you will basically pay a tax of US dollar 15 to 30 percent, which is 15 US dollars withholding tax. So you basically can incur taxes even with losses and uh, this definition has also been deferred. So in terms of the focus areas for banks, certainly screening capabilities against the NPFFI list. 
then aggregation account uh, across accounts, uh, both automated aggregation and also using the help of relationship managers. There are some threshold exemptions which are available for the individual depository accounts less than US dollar 50k for both pre-existing and new accounts and for entity accounts less than US dollar 250k and this is only for pre-existing however, not for new accounts. So matching is required against US Indicia and customer due diligence on new and pre-existing accounts. Uh, you need to collect additional documentation to prove that the payee is not subject to withholding. You need to capture new information. So there are numerous new pieces of information, recalitrant account holders, NPFFI, things like that. So capturing this new information on, your, uh, on the bank um, database. Withholding tax deductions if needed. So as I mentioned in the UK IGA, it's a slightly different mechanism. And of course, banks need to report withholdings and also report US account holders, including those who are suspect and, uh, and any payments made to NPFFIs. And banks need to manage refunds. And of course, the, so which basically means that if you've done a withholding, the, 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 the entity or the individual who you've done a withholding on is entitled to claim a refund and so you should be able to manage it. So in summary, FATCA involves a massive data quality and technology project and uh, it needs the focus of financial crime risk compliance to make sure that this is, uh, that, that, that this project is being undertaken in a proper manner and it's going to reach the results that, it's, that, that, that are expected. That's it. Thank you.